kids. Tell your dad you'll fix his printer later and listen up. It's time for another stellar edition of .NET Rocks, the internet audio talk show for .NET developers with Carl Franklin and Rory Blythe. This is Karen Cavallaro here to announce show number 52 with guests Ted Neward and Bruce Tate. Recorded February 27, 2004. .NET Rocks is brought to you by Franklin's Net, training developers to work smarter. And by Data Dynamics, makers of ActiveReports.net. Simple, powerful, and cost-effective reporting for Windows Forms and ASP.NET web applications. Online at www.datadynamics.com. Support is also provided by Code Magazine, Microsoft Technologies in-depth for IT managers and developers. Online at www.code-magazine.com. And by Perforce Software, makers of Perforce, the fast software configuration management system. Online at www.perforce.com. And now, the man who just flew in from Boston, and boy, are his arms tired, Carl Franklin. Digital blood without any pain. All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Karen, very much. And thanks to all of you, the teeming millions, for tuning in to another stellar edition of .NET Rocks. I am Carl Franklin here live in New London, Connecticut. And uh, this is show number 52. As Karen was saying that, I was looking over at Ted, and he just couldn't believe it. 52? <laughs> <laughs> You've been busy, man. Well, anyway, just sit tight, Ted. Uh, I want to uh, first introduce my co-host, my partner in crime uh, from Portland, Oregon, one, one last time. Well, so we think, anyway. Uh, Mr. Rory Blythe. Rory, how are you, my friend? I am doing pretty well. You sound uh, pretty well. Yeah, well, I mean, last week I had the flu, so I got to be doing better this week. Absolutely. Yeah. Did the user group thing last night, gave a little talk. How'd that it's go? Just, it went really, I, I think it went really well. Um, Chris Sells was my code monkey. <laughs> I, I felt a little weird, though. I, I, the analogy I used last night was that I was giving a piano recital and i had mozart there to turn the pages but uh <laughs> still cool had a good time i wanted to do some stuff on some of the less often frequented parts of the framework because the framework's so big right right that's one thing that we all learn i mean at first we know it's big and then three years later we're totally absolutely convinced of it and there's so many parts that people just don't really pay attention to so i wanted to cover a couple of little things that i thought might have slipped by for some people so it was cool had a good time and then supposedly longhorn's going to make it like Half again is big. <laughs> Half again? Well, aren't we getting the entire Win32 API condensed into... It's going to be monstrous. Yeah, yeah, download this before you uh, before you place your Amazon.com order. <laughs> <laughs> so what else is happening? Uh, you, well, did the, you did the, the Portland thing. Your next show, you're going to be here in New London, yep. of course. Not going to have to Skype in anymore, which is going to be so nice. Yep. I'm excited about that. We're excited to have you. Yeah. And uh, aside from that, just finally saw my neurologist again about the facial numbness thing. Oh, yeah? Yeah. And he seems to think that it's, he just called it complex migraine and refused to get any more specific. But he put me on some weird blood pressure medication and he said I might pass out at any given moment during the first few days of taking this. So if you just get silence on my end, it's probably not Skype <laughs> uh, failing. <laughs> It's my face. I can't feel my face. My <laughs> lip it falls down in my face. <clears throat> well, uh, Rory, you know, as you know, we, and as listeners know, we get lots of email, and I like to uh, read the email at the beginning of the show and give away some .NET Rocks coffee mugs. Uh, so this one is from Andrew Davy, who's in the UK, and he says, Hey, Carl, I've been thinking about the whole C-sharp versus VBNet debate, and for those people who didn't listen to the last show, we sort of turned up the fire on that uh, on that issue. And uh, you make the point that C-sharp programmers like spending hours hacking away at their keyboards coding, whilst VBers have time to wash their hair, et cetera, because they're just so damn productive. <laughs> and, you know, that is a joke, by the way. Now consider what happens if the C-sharp programmers see the light and switch to VBNet. Since they love spending all day coding, they will continue to do so, thus making us look incredibly lazy. So for all us VBNet programmers who like our hair well-conditioned, Please stop preaching to the C sharpers. <laughs> 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 All right, Andrew, <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna send you a coffee mug. What was that, Roy? 
Well, I was just going to, you got to remember, I am a C sharper. Yeah, that's true. That said, though, I liked what Scott said last episode about disparate mindsets getting together at the end of the day like Top Gun and saying, you're okay, kid. Absolutely. And that's what we do. I mean, you know, this show is a shining example of that. Yo, Carl and Rory, says Dana McNeil. What's happening? Really enjoyed the last show with Scott. The stuff about declarative programming was very interesting, although I've got to admit that if Scott thinks the guy in accounting is going to be able to edit, modify, manage any XML file, he's out of his freaking mind. We all think XML is the bomb, but I recently tried to do a similar thing with a client, and I may as well have been speaking Klingon in reverse. The XML f- <laughs> I haven't tried that, but... <laughs> that might I hear be cool. it's actually English. If you speak Klingon in reverse, it's actually English. <laughs> the XML file I got back was beyond useless. And Carl, hey, big spender, throwing around those VSNet editions like they're nothing. That MVP status must have its perks. Remember, we are humble VB programmers at heart, right? Well, uh, okay, Dana. I, I got the message loud and clear. We have an extra copy of uh, Visual Studio Developer, so we will send that to you. And... Uh, and let this not be a precedent to everybody else who wants to go beg for him. Because that was my last get, copy. You're going to get flooded with email. Now. That was oh. my last copy. Uh, yeah. And the only thing I want to say to you, Dana, is besides that about the XML is we don't actually assume that end users are going to edit XML files directly. That's what UI is for. Thank you very much. This one came from John V. Barone. He says, I've been a longtime listener. Thanks for all the work you do on it. But today I must write in regarding what I've heard. First of all, and this goes back to the whole C-sharp VB thing. First of all, I actually like Tab better than Diet Coke. And he's referring to something Scott said on the show about Tab. <laughs> I drink Diet Coke, or was it you, Roy? Did you no, do no, the Scott Tab said thing? That, that, yeah. that was Scott's witticism. Okay. I drink Diet Coke only when there is no Tab to be found. Why? I grew up in the 70s, and my parents made me drink the diet drinks of the time. So I acquired the taste for Tab, but I will never think that old Fresca was any good, no matter what. I'm also writing about the debate around which the Tab comment came up. I've had the programming history of 1. Access, 2. VB6, 3. VBNet. While I agree with you that VBNet is a great language, I've decided to pick up C Sharp as well because there are a few things about VBNet that have frustrated me. Hmm. 1. Tools. It always seems that when tool vendors do some nice add-in for VSNet, the first version out the door is the C-sharp version. Then sometime later comes the VB version. This is probably the biggest thing for me. Are you listening, tool vendors? Uh, two, there is still a perception that VBNet programmers are idiots who need their little hands held. This one is really annoying because us VBNet people who started out at V10 had, work har- had to work hard to unlearn and learn a lot of stuff to be productive in .NET. And some of what I've heard about Whidbey doesn't make me feel better about that, especially the part about hiding the designer-generated code in a WinForm code window. Doesn't it always do that Yeah, now? it does that by default, I thought. There's even a nice little, I don't know exactly what he means, uh, there's even a nice little blog discussion regarding refactoring in VB Whidbey, which shows this too, and he gives us a, uh, a link to Paul Vick's blog. Uh, we'll post that. I have never gotten over some of the dumb decisions Microsoft made back in Beta 2 to appease the .NET crowd. Every time I type and also, or or else, or is that and also, or else, or else, I just want to grit my teeth. <laughs> then every time I have to do extra figuring out of upper bounds of arrays to accommodate a redim makes me want to scream. I, I feel your pain, John. I, I'm with you. <clears throat> I still like VBNet. Anyway. I think you need to send him a coffee mug so he can put his tab in it. Yes. Yes, we'll s- actually, we'll send him a travel mug. There you go. You know, that, yeah. that can, that's a hot, cold thing. One last uh, uh, thing here. And this came from uh, Michael Stiefel, who is an author, the author of a book on uh, C-sharp application development using C-sharp and .NET, <clears throat> and who's as- actually speaking at the same conference that Ted and I were speaking at, uh, DevEdge East, uh, in Boston, hence the boy are my arms tired joke. So we were talking about this whole thing at dinner, and uh, he he expressed this uh, opinion, which I asked him to write in and, uh, and and send us a little email. So he says, I think people, and he's a C-sharp programmer, by the way, if I didn't make that clear. I think people who feel that VBNet is an inferior language to C-sharp, or that somehow think C-sharp is a better language, or the official language for accessing the .NET Framework class library, are just plain wrong. Now, as a C-sharp programmer, my personal opinion is that I prefer C-sharp to VBNet because I like the compact syntax, among other things, but that is a personal judgment. People who talk that way about VBNet are confusing three issues. 
first suitability to access the FCL. And I believe he's talking about the framework class library. Every example in my book, Application Development Using c and .NET, has been translated into VBNet and works exactly the same way. I have used the same courseware for both c training and VBNet training, with only the only difference being that the examples were in different languages. From the point of view of the, of the class library, everything c can do, VBNet can do as well, and vice versa. Second issue, suitability to a given task. Equality before the framework class library or the CLR is not everything. Perl.net can do things that C-sharp cannot. Does that make Perl.net a better language than C-sharp? <laughs> no. It just makes it a better choice in some cases. If you need to use unsafe mode, you need C-sharp. You can't overload operators in VBNet. Actually, you can and would be. But you might find VBNet's late binding feature more convenient than using the reflection API in C-sharp. You might like background compilation in VBNet. It is possible that for certain features, the IL that c -sharp generates is a bit more efficient than the IL that VBNet generates. I don't know if this is true, but even if it is, it probably doesn't matter for most applications. After all, in some performance situations, managed C++ is better than c -sharp. And finally, there are matters of personal preference. I like c -sharp's compactness. I think it has certain advantages, but that is a matter of taste. Uh, taste is important even in technical matters, but do not confuse taste with other factors or mistake taste for intuition. I wish VBNet programmers a long and productive life. VBNet programmers should not feel inferior. Sincerely, Michael Stiefel. Hmm. Interesting. That, that was a very well thought out letter. Yeah. And it came at just the right time because I was about to say that it seemed to me that the only people left on earth who don't understand that VB.net and C Sharp aren't really all that different are C Sharp programmers. But obviously, there's one who has it figured out. So Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And uh, we'll talk some more about that uh, later. But, uh, Rory, I think it is time for Google Weirdos. Yeah. Do, do I have my song yet? No, not yet. Next show, Did when you you're here. Something like Google Weirdos? I mean, come on. Give me something. <laughs> All, <laughs> All right. right okay, ready? I'll do it. Well, I want my two, song next three. time, man. Google, Google Weirdos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay, I, I, that's... We're not going to use that next time. Okay. It was okay for a little impromptu kind of thing, but we're going to do something really shiny. So here we go. Google weirdos. So the first one, and the trend of communicating to me through Google now is really growing. It's, it's obviously going somewhere. I think people are picking up on this. So the first one is, Rory, it's my birthday. Give me some love. And I think I know who this is. My friend Stuart Laughlin, who runs bistrotech.net, yeah. his birthday was on the 25th. And although they showed up in my Google referral log, 20 times, which seems like a little bit, you know, it seems like a lot. I think, I think that was just Stuart. So happy birthday, Stuart. You know, you, you earned it, buddy, by, I guess, getting older or whatever. The next one, and this is another attempt to, at uh, communicating to me through my blog, and this seems to be the move to Connecticut related. I'm going <laughs> to steal Rory Blythe's girlfriend. Okay, <laughs> that's a little creepy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how Google's going to help you out with that. A little weird, so... I, just I have one word for you, there. Rory. eBay. <laughs> <laughs> got another one here. It's okay to pop pimples, I guess. I mean, I don't, I don't know how this got to my side. I don't know what the person's trying to get out of Google for this stuff. But sure, I'll agree with you. It's okay to pop pimples. I had a long <laughs> conversation with a Starbucks barista about three weeks ago on this very subject. And she seems to think it's not just okay, but wonderful. And she actually had a whole set of jargon associated with the process. Like, acne on the back. You know what she calls it? She calls it back knee. That's how often she does it. Okay, okay Rory, Rory, you need to go to Starbucks far less often. <laughs> hey, we haven't introduced you yet. You be quiet over there. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Moving along, and Carl, this one's about you. Okay. All right. Th this is a little weird. It says, Carl Franklin sells out. I mean, come on. Yeah, that's why I'm going, people. It's because That's Carl all I do. Millions. I mean, when? Promise <laughs> millions and an island of virgins, and that's why I'm going to New London. It's, yeah, get real, people. You know? <laughs> Moving have along. I never not sold out? I, <laughs> have yeah, I ever I, not sold I just, I, I, What drives me nuts is that when you get a little bit of success, when you're doing well, you know, people automatically always assume that you've sold out. It's right. like Scoble posted the other day on the Gay Marriage subject. And somebody put in there, ah, Scoble saw a dip in his uh, traffic, and so he decided to post on this subject. I mean, give me a break. Scoble has so much traffic. <laughs> really? that he does not have to post on anything if he doesn't want to. Right. I get tired. Yeah. I hate it when people just accuse people of doing this and that for 
just little garbage reasons. It doesn't so, doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So moving along, we've got worm ball. I don't know what a worm <laughs> ball is, but I hope this person invites me over to dinner. It sounds totally horrifically <laughs> disgusting. And maybe they're going to follow it up with the next search, which is Fred Meyer colon cleanser. Oh, what, what that is? I mean, have you just tried soap? And I don't know. <laughs> Are there bottles of colon cleanser out there? And they're just in a section of the department store I've never walked through? That sounds really gross. Moving along, we've got invisible G-string, which seems a little excessive. I mean, you've gone far <laughs> enough to make it a G-string. You can't see the damn thing. Does it have to be invisible? Is it even there anymore? This is a deep philosophical question at this point. One more, we got uh, educational requirements for astronauts. If you're Googling for this, you're probably not qualified. <laughs> I want to let you know that. It's, it's not just a high school diploma and, you know, a nice letter to the head of the astronaut school. You know, it's going to be a little more involved than that. And then lastly, I smell really bad armpits. And just a clue, if you're alone, yeah, it's probably you. So <laughs> there you go. So that, that's Google Weirdos for this week. And uh, Very good. Very good. Enough to pile where that came from these things just keep coming in because people can't stop being completely weird so <laughs> i love it well rory uh i guess we should get down to business uh and talk about uh, today's show today's show i think is going to be a widely listened to show because we are going to attempt to uh talk about the dot net versus java and i won't say debate but just the whole all the issues surrounding these, the relationship between these two uh, technologies. And uh, Rory actually has done uh, Java programming, yep. and then he is a, a convert. He has seen the light. <laughs> Rory, put your hands on the screen! <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and anyway, uh, Bruce, Bruce Tate and Ted Neward are, uh, are here also. Ted is in the studio, as you've heard uh, from his comments. And Ted is uh, from Develop Mentor. Currently, he is the, uh, what is your title at the server side? Are you the editor? I am chief? the editor-in-chief. Editor-in-chief. Not just editor, but editor-in-chief. At the server side.net, which we'll talk about in a, in a minute about that uh, website. Uh, it's basically a huge portal for .NET developers, and we'll want to talk some more about that. And, uh, of course, he has done speaking, authoring uh, in the Java space and as well in the .NET space. And also we have on the phone Bruce Tate. Now, Bruce Tate is a consultant uh, with 15 years of IT experience, and he's worked at IBM for 13 years in roles ranging from database systems programming to Java proof of concept team uh, to the Java proof of concept team lead, where he served on the certification board for the IT profession. And he left IBM to build a solutions development team at a high-powered TL Ventures startup and left that post to build his own consulting business. He has eight patents, ranging from database design to development environment user interfaces, and is the author of three books, including the best-selling Bitter Java and Bitter EJB. Hey, Bruce, how are you doing? Great. How about yourself, Carl? Awesome. You sound great. I'm glad to have you on the show. So uh, where should we start with this uh, enormous issue. I mean, this is the result, you know, the whole Java versus .NET and open source is another thing. You know, these are little camps that have sort of parked themselves on the net, you know, at different places like Slashdot, right. and they're constantly throwing mud at each other. So we thought we'd bring a little little sanity and a little objectivity to this uh, discussion. Why don't we start with you, Bruce? Yeah, you know, Carl, I, I think it's amazing that um, that there isn't more synergy between between the two camps, you know what I mean. I agree. It's, the 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 Java language tends to excel on the server side, especially around enterprise programming. Um, anything but EJBs. The Microsoft frameworks tend to really excel at the user interfaces. I mean, I know I wouldn't want to um, do any kind of swing development for any any length of time. And rich client support is incredible on the Microsoft platform. So I've I've been amazed that the animosity is this deep. So you kind of want to see these things take on a niche of some sort? You want to see them working together in the sense that Windows development takes place quite a bit more on the desktop, and you'd like to see more Java server-side stuff and everything working together? Essentially, I mean, is that what you're saying? I don't think I characterize it that way. I mean, I think that there's always going to be a place for um, homogeneous shops that, that like that, that buy into the Microsoft platform end-to-end, -end, and there, there's always going to be a place for Java client-side applications, especially where you don't always have Windows clients. But one clear place where, where we need to be working together um, is, is 
Microsoft clients to rich Java enterprise frameworks, and, and that's not happening. You walk into right. Barnes and Noble, you'll you probably won't even find one book on J2E and uh, .NET Interop, and that's amazing. There is there is exactly one book that I know of. Uh, actually, two books that I know of. Uh, one which I recommend, and the other which I won't mention. Uh, the one I got to plug my homie in Redmond, Simon Guest, uh, the .NET J2E okay. interoperability toolkit. Um, and you know, I mean, Simon, you know, Simon does a pretty good job of you know nailing down, you know, because everybody talks interoperability, everybody starts talking web services, but there's a whole slew of things that come up as soon as you start talking about angle brackets and you know objects and XML and and the object hierarchical impedance mismatch that comes in there. Um, so I think, I think the subject is starting to be discussed. I think there are people who are starting to say, you know, yeah, I've got, you know, .NET stack over here and, and J2E stack over here and they need to talk to one another. But yeah, it's still for a lot of people, it's still kind of a, kind of a holy grail. I mean, it's still kind of yeah. a, how do I, how do I make this work? You know, the XML stuff doesn't seem to be there yet. Well, if you think about it, who's got the incentive to, to provide that bridge? I mean, neither Sun nor Microsoft <laughs> does really. Well, it's well, interesting. There's, there's two that really do, and that's that's IBM and Microsoft. Yeah, and, okay. And they've they've really. It's amazing to me that they're the catalyst that's that's kind of bringing this together. When um, you know that that was a, a, a bitter war um, uh, up to ten years ago. Hmm. Well, tell them about your Comdex stories, Bruce. Uh, I don't think I want to go there for this particular audience. Actually, we have a, a quite sophisticated audience. You you know. Any, anything that's kind of salacious or even, uh, it, you know, mildly uh, off color is totally okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll take a pass on that one, but um, I, okay. I was. You know, we're not going to let this go, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> I just well, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you um, one of the one of the the more benign stories. Um, there was supposed to be a debate in, in the old Windows OS two days, right? Right. And um, there was a guy. From IBM, you probably uh, don't remember his name, but um, he was supposed to be the one to kind of lead the grassroots movement and kind of um, storm through Microsoft, right? Okay. And and th- this this group called Team OS2 had taken to calling him the Blue Ninja, right? Yeah, I seem to remember that. Right. Um, a guy a guy named John 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 Toy Ring, and um, they were supposed to have this debate with um, some of the key Windows architects. I'm not sure if I remember who, exactly who they were, but Clearly, two, two, two of the top three minds at Microsoft, and um, also Petzl, you know, the, right. the, the great Windows author. Um, well, <laughs> their plane was late, so they were going to cancel this debate, right? And there was uh, another guy um, named Bob Rafali, who also had a, a set of books that he wrote only on the OS2 side, and his were, were called, you know, the OS2 Survival Guide or the Client Server Survival Guide, and he started a line of, um, of books in this area. These are the ones and, with the Martians on the cover, if you've ever right, seen them. Right, story. right, right. Okay. Um, they've been commercially successful, but they're not the best technical books ever written. You're <laughs> and generous. I'm, I'm sorry, Bobby, if you're listening, right? <laughs> um, but Bob was in the audience, and he agreed to do this debate, clearly without any, any preparation, right? So um, the, the two Microsoft guys came up to the podium. They had four minutes, and they um, laid out all these papers, probably five or six, um, rows deep and three rows and, and just, just looked like they were about to absolutely launch. And they said, we're Microsoft and we brought you Windows. And they stacked up the papers like, that's all there is that needs to be said, right? Hmm. And um, so Bob Rafali, who clearly has not had time to prepare, stands up, saunters down to, to the front of the podium, and he, he has these papers, you know, I don't know if it was like a manuscript or anything, but it definitely wasn't notes because he's agreed to this thing five minutes before lays out all his papers in six rows, you know, kind of kind of mimicking the Microsoft guys. And he, and he said, we're IBM, and we brought you Microsoft. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> what's, wow. the, what's the old joke? What do the letters IBM stand for? I built Microsoft. Actually, we had a, a whole whiteboard dedicated to that at a startup company I was in at that time. <laughs> I've, I've heard them all inferior but marketable. It's oh, better manually. Go. I'm Inter- buying a Macintosh. <laughs> <laughs> on and on and on. Yeah. Part of the genesis of this show, uh, Bruce and I do a uh, talk very similar to this for a series of small conferences uh, called the No Fluff, Just Stuff uh, Symposiums. 
Okay. And uh, one of the things that, you know, we're, we, we try to do at, at the start of each talk, and I, I have a feeling it's, you know, probably necessary to do here too, is just from, you know, what, we, what we're really trying to do is to have, you know, a fairly reasoned, you know, relatively objective discussion, at least as much as can be done. But, but Bruce right. has a great phrase that he uses at the start of this. Uh, he says, look, what we're doing is we're comparing apples and oranges. Yeah. These are really two, you know, two very different software stacks for all the similarity, right? It's really hard for us to get down to any kind of objective measurement. Right. Just because in many cases, a lot of the culture is different between these two. And, you know, the way in which you go about and build an application is different. And it, you know, we go back to the one attempt to try to build some kind of objective measurement, you know, the, the, the pet store. Yeah, the pet, pet store, store shop. Pet yeah, store pet shop uh, app. benchmark that, that the middleware company, right, my current employers, um, you know, uh, did. And, you know, very frankly, it's it's been an interesting struggle to try to get something that's, even relatively objective between the two platforms, right? It's just it's just hard, um, and so I think it's just important to say, look, you know, neither you know Bruce is not here to try to convince .NET programmers to adopt Java, right. nor, you know, nor am I, nor am you know. When, it's about getting along with what's there. Well, it's about understanding the really more than anything else, right? Because right? at least at this point, right today, not a lot of people are having to deal with the .NET J2E interoperability issue yet. Okay. It's coming though, and I'm yeah. I'm pretty convinced this is going to be a major. And you're issue. talking actually about calling code directly from one platform to I'm another, talking about or just the whole gamut, right? Okay, I mean, being able to coexisting on the server yeah. can I coexist inside the same process? Right, right, those sorts of things. It's just it's going to be huge. It's going to happen. So, what do you think of um, jump the jump toolkit and J Sharp and all that stuff? What did Microsoft really try to do with that? Well, honestly, uh, I've been in, you know, uh, I count uh, David Weller, uh, who is at one point in his life sort of the, although he hates for me to describe him this way, he was kind of the J-sharp evangelist. And, um, you know, he, uh, he, he basically, I think, described it the best way. He said, look, you know, J-sharp is really intended for a migration path for customers who are doing J++. Yeah. Now, uh, Brian Keller, who is the program manager for J Sharp, one of the things that, you know, he has said is that this is not to imply that, you know, Microsoft will, will abandon this thing in a year or two. Right. They've got this, you know, five plus two program where if right. they release a product, it's got to be out there, you know, active development for five years right. after its last release plus two more years of support. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think, you know, I, I think in many respects you could do, you know, some, some good Java development, right? If you're a Java developer and you, you know, want to come over to the .NET platform, J Sharp is an interesting place to go because it's, 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 you know, less language stuff that you have to learn. Right. Right. You don't have to learn the using keyword and, right. and, you know, the property syntax and so forth. Right. But at the same time, I mean, Java and C Sharp are already so similar and so much of your, APIs from the Java world are just not present because J Sharp is a 1.1 compliant right, uh, right, right, API. Right. Um, you know, all the, all the favorite stuff that you're used to from the JDK is just not present in J Sharp. Right. So it's it's an interesting. You know, Simon makes a, a really good distinction between three different degrees of you know what I'll say coexistence. Okay. He says there's migration, portability. And interoperability. Migration is I'm going to rewrite the whole thing in whatever the new language is. Migration is I'm going to keep the code as is, but recompile it. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, interoperability is we're just going to talk to each other, each from our own platform. And I think J Sharp fits really well in the in the uh, portability camp. Um, Serverside.net, we just ran an article, or we're about to run an article, I'm sorry, on uh, the Naked Objects framework. In, mm. Which is something that's big in the Java space right now. People are talking about it and experimenting with it and so forth. And you can take the this code base that was designed and written in Java. Mm-hmm. They had no real in, you know intent or desire to you know to to rewrite it in .NET, but they just took J Sharp, threw it at it, and compiled it, and just huh. compiled flawlessly. Right. Right. And so you can do naked objects. In .NET, right? And the fact that the library was written in J Sharp doesn't mean that, you know, right, right. you guys know. Sure. It's um, just the language. It's not the... Exactly. It's just another library. You, you, you know, it's an assembly you reference and off we go. Right. But I think that underscores something that's kind of important where if you're looking to try to create a single source base, 
right? For at least certain things that aren't really uh, BCL dependent, like you know, logic, business logic, business right. objects, that sort of thing. You could do that. Right. You could you could have sort of this cross source based thing, which I think is kind of an interesting. I don't know how useful it is yet, but I think it's kind of an interesting idea. Right. I mean, are people really going to be doing that? I was thinking that Scott was on the show last week, and they're dealing with a lot of situations where, as he put it, they were a little island of .NET in the middle of all this Java. And I'm guessing they're just going to go for any sort of interoperability route. I think, I think they're just big in the angle bracket camp. Is really yeah. what's going on. <laughs> That's where the industry investment is, right? Um, between, between IBM and Microsoft and Ashley Borland also, it's, it's, interoperability is all at a very high level, and I'm not convinced that that's the most useful place. It's going to be interesting to watch. I just, with, without a doubt, this is this is such a huge thing because you know the 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 industry numbers that I'm hearing, right? And then of course the numbers change depending on who you talk to. But you figure J2EE anywhere between 35 to 40 percent of the market, .NET anywhere between 35 to 40 percent of the market. Again, it really depends on who you ask. Mm. That's 70 to 80 percent of the market right there. Yeah. That tells you a couple of things. A, neither one of these guys is going to win anytime soon. And B, that means that neither one of these guys is going away anytime soon. So these two camps are going to have to learn how to get along. They're going to have to learn to work with one another. And, uh, you know, if I can uh, insert a quick plug, I'm in the middle of writing a course for Developmenter on J2E.net interoperability. Uh, we're debuting it in Redmond in a couple of weeks. And uh, I, I, I'm just convinced. I mean, I wouldn't be doing going to this degree of effort if I didn't think that this was going to be a big deal. Yeah, I mean, it's right. going to be something that people are going to have to face. I definitely agree. And I think beyond that, um, we, we also need to cross-pollinate and other ideas as well. Mm -hmm. again, again, I think that Microsoft user interface development process is, is far beyond what we see in the Java camp. As oh, far as understanding yeah. users, as far as oh, yeah. just the way that they go about building user interfaces. And by the same token, I think that the extreme programming movement in the Java space that kind of brought about this idea of automated unit testing and continuous integration, those ideas need a much sounder footing in the .NET camp. Mm -hmm. Oh, I don't know if you know this, Bruce, but there's a new imprint of MS Press Books coming out, and one of the first books they're doing in that uh, new imprint is Ron Jeffries doing extreme programming in C Sharp. I think that's mm. fantastic. I also also saw the article series that you did by Justin Getland mm -hmm. on um, C Sharp, on continuous integration and unit testing right. with C Sharp. Right. And I also um, saw um, on your show, Carl, that, that you've, you've recently done unit testing. And I think that this is probably one of the most powerful things, right. or probably the most things that happen, that's happened in, in the past five years from a process perspective in the Java camp. <laughs> So, so some of the things of uh, extreme programming you guys like, obviously. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, um, especially automated unit testing. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I I don't understand um, how um, how we've we've lived this this long without it. It's just mm -hmm. tremendous. You can be tremendously more productive and and build much better quality with unit testing. Yeah. It, it is, of course, important to temper that interest too, though, because I've seen places rely almost entirely on unit testing. Well, see, that that's the, the problem there, Rory, is that people don't understand what unit testing is for. It's not designed to replace your QA department. Right. It's right. really intended for, it's really intended as a developer level, you know, QA kind of issue. So and, you don't have to push it out with 600 bugs. Yeah, well, just so that you know as a developer. I mean, you know, part of the thing that you go back to the original Kent Beck Extreme Programming book, and one of the things that struck me about XP is that all of the principles that he lines up line up against one another, right? They're counterbalancing forces from one particular thing. For example, right, if you want to go in and refactor code, how do you know that you're not breaking everything? Well, that's really what unit testing was intended to, you know, sort of counteract. If you know your unit tests pass, you know that you didn't break anything. Right. Right. But people have been sort of going through the XP book and picking and choosing the parts that they liked. Right. They've been saying, oh, well, we don't really want unit testing, but we like user stories. Mm -hmm. And I got a buddy of mine who did some work for a major financial firm um, and they were, they had adopted the parts of XP that they liked and didn't really, you know, d if they didn't like a particular aspect of it, they just didn't do it. And it was an unmitigated disaster. I mean, he has nothing but bad things to say about XP as a result. Hmm. 
And, you know, I just look at that and I say, well, that's because you didn't have something to counterbalance this particular element. Well, that's true. I mean, XP is many things more than just that. And yeah, there are some right. elements that people don't like. I think especially the uh, the sort of the dual programming thing the pair programming, works, right. pair programming, works right. for some people, but not for others. And I, I absolutely agree. But I think that um, the, the Java community has, has, is a little bit ahead of the .NET community in recognizing that there are principles that... that you can apply much more broadly than, than XP as a process. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So yeah. from a unit testing perspective, the Java community tends to understand that we are investing in unit testing in one way or another anyway, right? Mm-hmm. Either by um, manual tests, which, um, which work up to a point until you accumulate a certain amount of code base, right? Yeah. Um, either, or, or print statements or logging. You're going to be adding these things to your code anyway. And, and if, if, they're in the form of automated tests. You just continue to grow that base basis, and you continue to um, check those every night with the build, so you know as soon as things break. Um, yeah. So the result is that you get a whole lot of benefit for the work that you've been doing all along, anyway. Well, uh, guys, we have a, uh, a caller on the phone, uh, Jason Moss, who wants to ask a question. Go ahead, Jason. Hey, I feel like I should do. You know, Start by saying like I'm a long time listener, first time caller, or something. Uh, <laughs> That's totally okay. <laughs> uh, uh, so I, I actually uh, found your site kind of uh, 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 on the first show, and I've been listening. Uh, I really like him. Um, anyway, um, uh, I, I sent you guys a question about uh, uh, sort of based about on security, and uh, uh, my question was that. Uh, in in an old older ASP application, uh, I saw t- a security technique used that uh, basically uh, used a com DLL and passed all it did was pass the request object, the response object, and the application object into a com DLL, and the com DLL handled uh, all the logic of uh, adding you know content to the response stream and everything. And uh, the security, of course, was that you couldn't really see any uh, VB script or anything like that, um, since uh, you would have to decompile a com deal or something or something like that. Um, my question is, is that a, is that still viable or is that a, a sort of good security technique uh, for a, an ASP.NET application? Well, are, are you asking, do you want to go from the ASPX, the ASP.NET app into a com DLL again, or do you, are you asking for sort of its logical equivalent? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say I'm more asking about its logical equivalent. Well, um, you know, I, I guess in in the ASP.NET world, I mean, part of what uh, you know, part of the, the the point behind COM was was to you know build that notion of the component model, and and you know, you'd have well defined entities, for lack of a better term, uh, you know, that you would you would uh, handle, and you know, in some respects, it's almost kind of like you built, you know, handing that that. Logic handing the the whole request off to, you know, the com DLL and say here you you deal with this you just handle it, um, you know that's in some respects very much like you know what what Tim Ewald was was referring to when he called them processor objects in transactional comp plus you know right. you're saying look here's an object just take this thing and go and when you're done hand me the you know hand me what you've finished, um, in in the .NET space, I would say you know, what you're doing is you're basically just spinning off an object and saying, "Here, object, go." Right? I don't right. know that you're. I don't know that the ASP calling directly into a com DLL to do whatever processing. I don't know that that's any more secure though than writing the code in VB script. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I agree. Mean, certainly, there are things that that VB script was was not real great at, but there were certain right. things that it was really good at. And I, I you know, I would. Speaking at the very high level with the very broad brush, yeah, I think you can just say hand it off to another .NET assembly or something. Right. One of the real benefits that I saw with that was that um, since the the com DLL you know was already compiled, there was no hit to interpreting all the VB scripts and whatnot. You could. Yeah, you're gonna get that performance boost, no question. But you know, in in the .NET space, everything's JIT compiled anyway. So. Right. That's why. Jason, are you a Java programmer also? Um, no, I've only done a uh, little bit of Java, not too much. Okay. Do you have any uh, questions about uh, Java in the .NET space uh, in general? Um, well, one thing that I've wondered about in terms of Java and, and .NET is that it seems like Java really has a lot of different uh, 
uh, I don't know, middleware or application servers that you can plug into it in terms of... Uh, that's probably the understatement of the new decade. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and it doesn't seem like the .NET model follows that very very closely. And so I, I okay, that's wondered, the understatement of the decade. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It seems like it seems like .NET sort of uh, ha- has its own model or, or uh, application model that it wants you to follow, whereas Java sort of leaves that open. I, I think that's a tremendously perceptive question. And, and I think that one of the things, one of the challenges of .NET has been um, for, for Microsoft to reshape the way that, that um, application servers are deployed. You know, for example, uh, how does, does Microsoft deliver transactions today? Is that in the operating system? In the future, is that going to be in the database? Where is the application server? And, and that's, that's a problem that Microsoft has not yet solved. To, to the satisfaction of, of its customers. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, guys, at this point, we're going to uh, pay the bills. We're going to uh, have an advertisement here. So we'll be back after this uh, word from our sponsor. Hey, Carl Franklin here, giving a shout out to my friends at Data Dynamics. Uh, we've talked a lot about active reports on this show, and this is no exception. So I'm talking about ActiveReports.net. This is a port of their popular Active Reports program. If you're currently thinking of doing reporting in .NET for Windows Forms or web applications, check out Active Reports for .NET. Uh, many of my friends in the business use and swear by ActiveReports.net. I use it as well. Now let me just tell you, to say that the reporting is simple does it an injustice because it makes you think that it can only do simple things. It can do very powerful things. But you don't have to go through hoops just to set up a simple report. When you create a report, the report exists with your application. Okay, It doesn't exist on a server somewhere. All right, We're not talking about enterprise reporting. We're talking about, I have some data, I want to print it out, or I want to show it to the user. PDF format is supported. HTML format is supported. All the great features you'd expect from a reporting engine Drop Dead Simple, and the best part, it's not going to break the bank. They have a great licensing scheme that's easy to deal with. So check it out at www.datadynamics.com. Now let's get back to our show. So Rory, the secret namespace of the day <clears throat> is uh, <clears throat> system.runtime.interruptservices. Cool. All right. So, so before the break, I think, Bruce, you were essentially saying that it seems that Java programmers have more of a context for XP, and it sounds like .NET coders are dealing with it as a series of kind of disconnected ideas and possibly not applying them as a whole the way they should. Is that what we were getting at? Yeah, that's pretty close. Um, and, and I think that the Java developers are starting to see that, are, are starting to apply those ideas in and, and out of the context of XP. For example, I was at a, a um, Fortune 500 cu- customer last week, and um, they used three XP, three of the XP practices pretty religiously, and those are automated unit testing, continuous integration, refactoring, pretty mm-hmm. religiously. Um, and yet, they were they had a, a stronger overall process within that they supported within their shop. Is there anything in .NET? I mean, I guess uh, system enterprise services. Uh, does the, is that sort of the middleware area of .NET, or oh yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you know, first of all, you know, after you know, in the post PDC world, right, we have to talk about two different time frames with respect to .NET, right? We've got pre Indigo and post Indigo, right? Because a lot of the middleware stuff in the .NET space is falling under the auspices of Indigo, right? right? So I think, you know, they really had to catch up sort of to re refactor if you will there. Well, yeah, I mean, it was, you know, as, as Bruce alluded to earlier, right? There were a lot of people uh in the, you know, in the the, the post J2EE time frame who went to Microsoft and said, "Where is your app server?" Yeah. And Microsoft said, "Oh, it's it's Com Plus. It comes with the operating system." Right. And a lot of customers said, "It comes with the operating system meaning if I want to get an upgrade, yeah. I've got to upgrade my operating system." Right, right, and right. that just didn't fly. Yeah. Um so I think a lot of the concepts of the middleware stuff are are sort of coming via Indigo. Okay. And I think it's fair to say that Microsoft, in many respects, is looking at web services 
as sort of their middleware stack, right? You look at, I mean, you just look at the the, the suite of specs that are coming out today, right? And it's almost one for one identical with the suite of specs that that Java has been pushing for a number of years in mm-hmm. the J2E space. Mm-hmm. You know, we've got WS transaction, we've got you know WS right. messaging, and so forth. Right. Um, so I think Microsoft is sort of making the conscious decision to say. We don't really want an app server per se. We'd like to see sort of web services take that on, which so is kind it, of a weird position. Yeah, as it far is. As as far, and also, what happens then to system enterprise services? Is that left to the people who are just hardcore Windows only kind of? Well, uh, you know, I certainly i, I don't i don't uh, i don't work for Redmond, and I don't have insider access as much as you know some might might think. Um, like I've heard, they're 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 continuing to push that big time. Yeah, I, I, I know Don said at, at PDC and in some private conversations, he said, "Look, you know, if you if you need some of the transactional support, if you're looking for, um, you know, there was a set of there was a set of very specific criteria that he issued at, at, at PDC right. uh, that basically said, you know, if you're doing stuff that that uh, really really screams com plus, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you specifically the key thing was transactional support, Transactions, distributed transactional distributed, support, yeah. I should say." Uh, yeah, go ahead and use system enterprise services, mm. right? And then in the same breath, he said, but the future is Azimax. Okay. Right? That's the direction that Indigo is taking. That's the direction that they're, they're you know, they're pushing. And I, I, I think that's kind of, uh, I don't think that was fair for Don to say that, mm. very bluntly. Mm. Uh, Don, if you're out there, I still love you like a brother, but I think you really screwed with some people's heads when you did that. Because now everybody's <laughs> afraid of it. They're like, you know, oh my God, I don't want to touch Complus. I don't want to touch system and enterprise services because I'm going to be, you know, they're going to drop support for it. No, as near as I can tell, that's most definitely not going to be the case. Well, uh, one of the keys here, though, is that this is, this is part of the interoperability story. This goes back to our talk about JTWE.net interoperability because the whole idea that, that, that Don added there was that you no longer need my runtime if you want to interrupt with me. You just, we, the, the whole idea is to get away from that. Isn't mm-hmm. that what you're saying? And if you're still going to be doing stuff in a, in a totally Windows world, then you don't need to worry too much about it. I mean, we're still going to have like remoting objects and you can define right. how it is that you want everything to take place. We can still do the whole binary thing. But, but at the same time, if you don't, if, if you actually want to work with other systems out there, it seems that Indigo is going to be really accommodating for that. We hope. We hope, yeah, because it, one of the things we have to recognize, right? And I think we we just saw uh, within the last couple of weeks, you know, what what a big concern with respect to web services is. How many different web service eventing specs do we have now? Yeah, really. We've got three: one from all HP, right? We've got one from IBM, Tibco, and a couple other people, and we've got one from Microsoft and and a couple other people there. And we also have eventing in Com Plus. Well, yeah, and then, and then of course in the Java space we've got JMS, but I'm just thinking, you know, straight within the angle brackets. World, yeah, okay. Right? We've got three different eventing models, right? So which spec do you write your code to? Right. You know, and we and, still don't know if, if XML. It, we still haven't really proven that model yet, right? Agreed. Agreed. We've got some interesting proofs of concept out there. We've got, you know, I was talking with Julia Lehrman at dinner Wednesday night right. uh, as part of the the uh, Edge East show. And she was saying that she's got uh, an application that she's built for one of her clients um, that's you know web services based simply because it was easier for her to use uh, as a Max and so forth than it was for her to go and, and do .dot net remoting, mm-hmm. which Absolutely. I found which I found an interesting you know interesting element because I've been telling people for a long time you know web services are all about interoperability right right you would you would only adopt this if you needed to go across platform boundaries. Um, so I think you know I think that's an interesting interesting element. I've seen that too. Yeah, I saw the I was in an all Microsoft shop, and they were talking between Microsoft apps using web services. Right. It's all within the Microsoft domain, and I thought that was a little bit strange. I would have used remoting myself. Well, because it's easy easy to set up and okay. yeah yeah possibly. Uh, we have a question from Mike Wayne from T Rex Corporation, Washington D.C., who says T Rex Corporation. Yeah, the T Rex T Dash wow. Rex Corporation. Are their competitors, the Raptors. <clears throat> yeah, very good. <laughs> <laughs> he says, "I was wondering what Ted and Bruce thought of the Mono Project to move .NET beyond Microsoft boxes, and what impact that will have on the J two E E world's grip." On Unix, on the Unix world, unfortunately, no Skype today. But thanks in advance for taking my question, Mike. Bruce, you want first crack at this, or uh, I think it's a great question, and and I think that um, it, it underlies a critical difference in the way that J two E has evolved and the way that that .dot net has evolved. Um, as as a counterexample, first, um, 
there's, if, if, if you recall, the um, kind of the driver behind automated unit testing is JUnit, right? And um, that's been ported to the .NET framework for how long now? Well, that's been out for, let's see, NUnit's been... Union's been around for two years or so. Right? I was going to say, I was going to say at least at least a year and a half. I think two years. Yeah, yeah, mm. that sounds about right. And um, I mean, for the first year and a half, it got absolutely no play, right? And it's not because the the um, the Microsoft camp didn't understand what what automated unit testing is and can do. It's, it's that it didn't come from Redmond. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And and um, so a large part of the problem is a political one. Right. It's it's um, so. I would characterize it almost more of a cultural one. Yeah, I was yeah. going to say that too. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, yeah, that, It's not that, so much that Microsoft is standing up there saying, "Thou shalt not use anything from Redmond." It's really just that you know, over the years, I mean, there have been so many situations where people started working with you know technology X. Microsoft realized technology X is getting interesting, so they get involved in it or they buy the company. Yeah, and, and it's. And, Interesting juxtaposition, right? Because here, here Microsoft is um, actually needing some um, some innovation from the open source community, and they're really encor- encouraging the open source community in a lot of ways, right? And they're not yeah. getting it. Mm-hmm. And the, in the meantime, Sun is um, doing just about everything they can to to squash <laughs> the open source community on the Java side, and and yet there's open source solutions for days, right? In fact, the open source solutions are actually shaping the things that are happening in the persistent space. Um, and the templating technology space, and on and on and on. Well, guys, uh, it's almost time to uh, hit the hour mark, and before we do that, we're going to have a musical interlude, and then we're going to have some folks from uh, Perforce Software on to talk about their products. So stick around, don't go away, and we'll come back to this uh, monojava.net discussion in a minute. Hey, uh, you know, I, this is Carl. I had the uh, a request to, to actually play some live music on the show. So I got out my guitar, and we're going to uh, kick up the reverb a little bit and just give you a little acoustic toy boy. And this is the theme song for our show. PCI 
I'm never deprived Infrared sensors for climate control Zero to warp speed and ready to roll Cause I'm a toy boy Out on the fringe Me who dies with the most toys wins Ooh. Got a cellular phone with 500 names. I call up my friends to play internet games. Digital blood without any pain. Gotta get enough points to finally land me a place in the online gamers hall of fame. 39 speakers in my living room. NASA complains about the sonic boom. Ten foot high screen, twenty feet wide. Strap it in tight, cause it's a long, sweet ride. And I'm a toy boy, a little to the right. These batteries should last all night. It's gonna take. Oh, take a lifetime Running around in circles Reaching for the goal Reaching, reaching for the gold ring What's gonna set you free? Set you free. Got a two seater sports coupe I can almost fit in. Stop by for some ice cream on way to the gym. My satellite dish, it's a damn sight to see. Got a transmitter band by the FCC. Yes, I'm a toy boy. Life is hard. I pay my taxes with my credit card. Yeah! Yeah! All right. You know, the scary thing is, I think you've described about three quarters of our industry there, Carl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, before, we, uh, before we get back into it, I want to uh, introduce John Walker from Perforce Software. Perforce is uh, sponsoring the show. And uh, they have an SCM system, a software configuration management system that not only works on uh, Windows, but works on uh, uh, works for Java, works uh, for Macintosh and for Linux. They have a command line interface. They do reporting, defect tracking. They have a web interface. They have merge tools and IDE integrations. Just a, a lot of stuff. And I thought uh, these guys would make a good sponsor because we're talking to .NET and Java developers and... Uh, and they have some good stuff. So, welcome, John. Are you there? I'm here, Carl. How are you doing? Very well. How are you? Enjoying the show? Uh, Carl, I'm telling you, I'm going to listen in for the music next time. <laughs> that was great. Uh, well, uh, Ted Neward and Bruce Tate are here, and uh, we want to ask you some questions about the Perforce SCM system. So, let's just start with you know the big picture. What is this, and why do developers care about it? Well... I guess the best way to look at Perforce is, as you said, um, it is an SCM system. Our competitors are companies like, or products like Visual Store Safe and Clearcase. Okay. I think that, you know, so people understand, I think, what SCM is, but what makes Perforce unique? I think it's that we were developed by developers for developers. So the way we really distinguish ourselves 
is that we are the fast and easy to use SEM system. Um, it's easy to install. It's uh, platform independent, as you've been mentioning. We run on actually run over fifty uh, platforms. And if you take into account, the are there that many? Yeah. Wow. Well, well, I mean, there's still that those four Amiga developers out there, right? Oh, Amiga, right? I had no oh, idea there were. Goodness, yes. <laughs> I had no idea there were fifty platforms. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and uh, the example of, of Amiga is uh, sort of uh, speaks to how flexible we are. <laughs> Don't tell me you actually run on the Amiga. That was intended as a joke. Oh no, we do. You oh my kidding. god! <laughs> no, we do. That's the irony because uh, actually early on, a founder of our company had a friend who wanted to do some SEM development on Amiga, and we can port very quickly. Oh, because does Amiga wild. even have a network interface? Yes, we do. Wow. That's... Yeah, we have a distributed a distributed uh, uh, architecture. Sweet. Um, you know, it's, it's client server. Um, you know, I, I invite people to go to our website and download the product. It's free of charge um, for a two user license, so you can test it out. Wow. Um, you know, there's no need to install any other ancillary or supporting technologies other than Perforce and TCP/IP. Um, hmm. The database that supports the product comes fully configured. Um, so all you need to do really is add your, you know, your source to the Perforce server, and then Carl, as you put it so nicely, we have those, all those different GUIs and clients that we support that allow you to, you know, use Perforce from Windows, um, Linux, FreeBSD, um, you know, Mac OS 10, um, and of course we're, um, you know, source code agnostic when it comes to the type of development. I mean, it can be Java, you know, .NET, um, you know, C Sharp. Uh, you know, coding C, um, and we support binary files as well. So I got to ask you, um, you know, I, being being you know putting on my Java and my my open source hat for just a second, why do I want to use Perforce as opposed to you know something like CVS, which is you know fairly well well established, well understood. You know, the, there's a lot of people who've backed it and so forth. I mean, I know you, you've mentioned it, sort you know, it's mentioned in your 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 press blurb, but I just you know. Why? Why use it as opposed to CVS? Uh, well, one of the things you we, we can definitely speak to is uh, usability, but I think that you know when it comes to really hard metrics about our difference between you know the two products, um, speed. Um, you know, we we consider ourselves the fast and easy to use SEM system, and I think that speed of execution um, or speed of use. Speed of execution. Really, okay. uh, and I also would say speed of use as well. Um, you know, the way we handle branching is is very intuitive. Um, with Perforce, um, and in terms of usability, um, we have a, uh, a feature called Atomic Change List, um, which means that you know we check in your code into as one logical unit of work. So, Carl, if you come to me and you say, John, you know, in the code line, there's this bug I want you to fix. It's bug you know zero zero six or whatever, and I determine that I need to open up you know three files. Um, let's say let's, let's say it's six files, three header files. And three C files, for example. Okay. Mm-hmm. Do people um, still I'm use a, C anymore? Excuse me. <laughs> I said, oh, do I'm people sorry. still use I'm C sorry. anymore? Say, uh, um, the Amiga coders. <laughs> yes, there you go. That's who it is. It's the Amiga coders. <laughs> okay, exactly. Uh, but let's say they're, they're, let's just go back to a simple example. Three files that are related. We'll just say. Okay. The three files, um, you know, are are related to this, this bug fix. Well, I can make my changes to those three files, and I submit them all as one transaction. And Perforce will ensure for you that all three of those files will be written into the into our repository or depot, as we call it, as one logical unit of work. If there's any trouble, then none of those files will be written into the depot until hmm. you have to maybe you know resolve your work with the work that another user has. Well, it's funny because I've, I've you know I've used CVS uh, for for a long time, and then I you know that particular aspect of of SCM never even occurred to me. The idea of you know if I want all three files to go up. But there's a merge conflict in one of them. I don't necessarily want the other two committed just yet. Right. Correct. It never even occurred to me. Exactly right. That's then you, you summarized it just as uh, as I would do it. Interesting. Sweet. Okay. So who who all is using your product? What are some of the companies that are using it? Um, Adobe uses our product. Um, AOL. Um, you know, Symantec currently has a single Perforce server instance running in Santa Monica, California. That is supporting over 1,100 users worldwide. Wow! Um, and at any given time, they can have upwards of over 400 users um, logged in, con- 
currently working on um, files. Sweet. Um, and you know, in, in one day, I think the, they've had over like four thousand transactions in one day against the Perforce server. Wow, that's yeah, pretty good. Those are pretty good numbers. Yeah, they are very good numbers. And, and uh, you know, SAP three thousand users um, using Perforce. Hmm. Um, EA, for example, uses our product as well. Sweet. Very cool. Well, it yeah. sounds it sounds awesome. What are some of the other um, coolest features that, that you can uh, tell us about? What are the merge tools all about? Um, we have a three-way merge tool. We actually have a new one um, that's released with our P4V product. Um, P4V is our GUI client that runs on Windows, Macintosh, um, Linux, and, and Solaris platforms. Um, and you know, that's, if you go to our website, I invite you to do that to see um, some screenshots of it. It's a really elegant um, three-way merge tool um, that allows you to, um, you know, very easily, you know, jump between conflicts okay. you know, in the merged code. Um, you can right mouse click and decide, you know, whose uh, changes you would like to integrate, you know, into your code. Um, and the and diffing tool is, is, is very elegant as well. But, of course, you know, many of our customers are um, really comfortable or even married in some cases to different diffing and merge tools that they want to use. And, you know, we actually facilitate that quite nicely. If from the command line or from any of our GUIs, they want to be using another third-party, you know, diff or merge tool, then we, you know, we allow that very easily. So I've got another question for you, John. I'm ready for it. One of the pain points. That's the question. (laughs) (laughs) One of the pain points uh, that I've run into on a couple of occasions, because I've been, you know, writing books and so forth, uh, I like to, you know, check in the uh, chapters as I write them, you know, and CVS does not handle binaries very fluidly. I think that's probably the gentlest way I could put that. That's correct. <laughs> Tell me that you guys do better things with binaries than CVS does. We sure do. Um, we support, um, you know, large binary files. And I guess that one way that I can really speak to that is with an example of some of our customers, of course. Um, NVIDIA, um, you know, they have, you know, the boards they design are stored as large, large binary files. Um, and, you know, they check those into Perforce. As a matter of fact, their repository or their depot is over one terabyte in size. Good um, Lord. And National Instruments <laughs> uses us um, as well. Check in a terabyte size file. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's not quite what he said. Let's but go to lunch. Makes said, for a good thanks. marketing cop. <laughs> hey, but I want you guys to know that before I came to Perforce, it's really like that hair club for men thing. I was also a customer of Perforce before I came here. Great. Um, and we checked in all of our spec files into the depot um, as well. You worked for Cy Sperling? <laughs> Didn't you say the hair club for men? What was that all about? <laughs> I'm trying to make an analogy. Oh, okay. Before I came to Perforce, so I was actually a customer as well. Oh, 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 oh. You know, oh I man. says that about... Yeah, I got you know, it now. Yeah, all of his own. hair is natural, Carl, I, I'm so sleeping. stop it. Stop yeah, it. I, know, I won't even go there, okay? You know, I may have to come on your show to prove that it's <laughs> natural. You can come on to a radio show and show us your hair. And you also, yeah. have, a, you also have a bug database built in, right? Yes, we do. We oh, do. Sweet. We have um, uh, the concept of jobs in Perforce. Um, which is um, highly, um, you know, basically configurable. And one of the reasons we made it configurable is so it would integrate with other third-party defect tracking tools as well. And Sweet. one of the things that you can do, which is very powerful, is, I, you know, the bug that was assigned to me that I fixed, um, I can represent that fix by assigning uh, a reference to the change list that fixed the bug. Yeah. So when you go and interrogate the bug definition or the job definition, as we refer to it in Perforce, you can um, you know link to the actual change list, and then you know diff the code and see exactly you know what did you know Ted, Bruce, or Carl do to actually implement this bug fix. Wow, that's cool. Because yeah, we would never let Rory ever fix a bug. Oh, is Rory there? <laughs> I yeah. caused it. I mean, <laughs> yeah, Rory's here. Okay, because I, I didn't see, I didn't hear his voice. So basically what you have is this fully featured product that has really nice integration points if you want to plug your own tools into the system as well. But if you don't want to, it's all there. Exactly. And you said it was free for two users? Correct. So I invite people to go and and download it. Um, If you want to do a full evaluation of the product, we'll grant you a 45-day evaluation license for as many users as you need. Jeez. Do a proper evaluation. 
And so what is what is the cost once you decide, yes, I love this, we wanna we wanna use it? How many children do you have? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a uh, a stepped or tiered pricing model. Okay. For the first seven for the first twenty users we charge seven fifty per user and our licensing is based on users, not okay. concurrent users. Okay. And, and then you- it just sort of steps up after that. It's uh, the next thirty at seven hundred. And then it's 650 from 50 to 100 users. Users are defined as like a, a login credential or as a machine? A login credential. Okay. Very cool. Okay. Because I do a lot of work, you know, from a laptop and from a desktop and, and right. so forth. So. Yeah. And what you can do is define what we call uh, workspaces, or which is the equivalent of a sandbox. So on one machine, you could have uh, a particular type of uh, sandbox defined for that machine. And you know how you want to work with the files, where you want them to exist on that particular machine, and then a completely different machine have another configuration if you want. One last, I've got just one last question. Okay. Uh, again, putting my my Java hat on. Do you guys have uh, Ant tasks so I can automate this? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, we have an integration with Ant. I should have mentioned that. That's a, for build tools. It's actually a very nice integration. So there's just basically a jar file you download. You put it in the um, Ant lib directory. Right. And those tasks are available to for you automatically. Um, you know, this, we call it syncs in Perforce, so you can sync files to a particular area and then do your ant build from that area. And then are you guys going to build like an MS build task when that comes around? Correct. Okay. Sweet. Absolutely. Now, well, one more thing I want to mention to you, okay. those Java people, but this is true, important for all developers, is how Perforce can help with refactoring. So if you change the name of a file, for example. We, we, we maintain the entire history of that file. Oh, that's Even if, nice. you, if you change the name or you move it. Um, and in our Eclipse and uh, P4 uh, Wasad integration for WebSphere, um, you know, refactoring is built into that integration. Sweet. That's very nice. Well, John, thanks for coming on online. And, and listeners can uh, go to your website at perforce.com to get right. more information, right? You, you got it, Carl. All right, John. Thanks a lot. Hey, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Sure, it sounds great. So we were talking about um, Java and Mono right. and Rotor and, you know, what the impact is on that. Yeah, I was just, you know, part of the interesting thing about Mono is, number one, is it opens up certainly .NET for the Linux crowd. And I think that Mono certainly occupies a special place in the, in the .NET camp uh, because of that. One of the interesting things, though, that we've got to simply, I think, recognize is that there are roughly 10 times as many developers in Redmond as there are guys working on the Mono project. And so one of the things that we, you know, you have to sort of look at is, can Mono keep up with the folks in Redmond, right? And I, I just, at least at this point, given, you know, the, the, the development cycle that they've been going through, they've achieved some amazing things, no question about it. Miguel's probably going to kill me next time he sees me for saying this. <laughs> but I just don't know that, you know, a .NET developer who's used ASP.NET 1.0, 1.1, coming over to Linux, firing up Mono and saying, cool, I can do all of this stuff. And it's not there, number one, because it's not ASP.NET anymore. It's right. their XSP, you know, clone, right? We don't have Win forms over there. It's like GTK forms or something right, like right, that. Right, right, right. It's just it's a different experience. And I don't know that the .NET culture is really ready for some of the interesting aspects of cross-platform compilation that kick in, right, or, or cross-platform right. development. I mean, uh, But at the same time, you know, I, I've got to say I'm really, really happy that the Mono guys are there because and, and every day that, that Microsoft continues to, you know, we're not going to squash them, you know, every day they continue to espouse that, that uh, philosophy – it really starts to build, I think, this notion that Microsoft, you know, starts to build a certain amount of credibility and, and faith. Microsoft wants an open source community and are willing to allow these open source environments to uh, to exist. Wow, okay. Uh, I think we have a caller here. Uh, Danny? Yes. Danny, so you have a question for uh, Bruce and, and uh, Ted? Yes, um, at the beginning of the show, they mentioned that uh, the that .NET, uh, the J2E platform was a really good platform for the server side of things, and that that net was really considered a great front end. I was wondering if it was any there's any strides right now to make Java a better front end platform, and to make um, I know that the that uh, the that 
system is becoming more and more, more um, server-side system than, than, than before. So I was wondering if there's any, any, anything internal going on in Java for the, for the client side. Yes, I, I definitely think that Java is trying to move in that direction. The big initiative is, um, is for a framework called Java Server Faces, right. which, is, which um, is basically a, um, if, if you're familiar with Java, it's, it's basically a set of JS, JSP tags and an event model that allow the, the, the client side user interfaces to talk to the server side more efficiently. It's and, sort of like it's sort of like web forms for the right, ASP.NET right. heads out there. A very primitive web forms, right? Yes. <laughs> so I guess I guess I guess the point being that um, that Java is is starting to make a movement in that direction. Um, before Java server faces, there wasn't even any kind of a movement towards a, a richer client. So um, they're moving in that direction. They're not going fast enough, and I don't think they're um, they're going to get there and and for the foreseeable future, at least. Yeah, I think I think you you know in the Java space historically, right? If if you wanted to do, you know, the rich client, you know, Sun's response was write an applet, and right. then we got you know uh, the Java Network Launch Protocol JNLP, which is you know pretty much a, a brother to you know click once and zero deployment and all that stuff mm-hmm. in the .NET space. Um, but that certainly has not you know, taking the world by storm. I right. mean, you don't routinely run across, you know, JNLP, Java Web Start apps out there. And I think in some respects, um, I think Sun is doing the Java community a disservice by continuing to put so much effort behind some of the some of the front end user interface toolkits that they've got. I mean they right, every they, JDK release there's a new uh, new extensions and so forth to swing, which right, is their right. cross platform UI. What do you think of that? I think it's an abomination. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really, um, I think that that Swing, the idea of creating. I mean, I don't know, if, I don't know how much the the .NET audience knows about Swing, but all of the painting done in a Swing app is done by Java code. We start with basically one window, yeah, right? just a rectangular area, and then everything inside that. It's one H win. Right. Oh, okay, and everything inside that is handled by Java. Code. So that's a layer of indirection you really can't afford to have in UI. Yeah, I mean, it's it's you. If you're going to run a Swing app, and if you're going to run a Swing app at all reasonably well, you really need one of these upper end machines to be able to do it. I mean, it's just a phenomenal amount of work that has to be done. Right? So, call to give you a funny story on that front. Um, Ted and I were giving this talk um, to Java guys. Right, um, right. there were probably sixty to eighty Java guys in the room. And um, we started talking about Swing, and, and we started really railing on it. And um, so pretty much 79 of the guys in the room were just um, smiling and nodding and just kind of piling in on, on this, this, um, this Swing framework. And one guy in the back of the room was just staunchly defending Swing, right? Um, and then after the talk was over, we were, we were saying, who was that guy? And we saw his name tag, and then we looked at the schedule, and it turns out he was giving a talk on um, on the limitations of swing right after our talk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we talked to him a little bit afterwards, and he said, yeah, you know, I mean, I don't particularly, I don't, I think he said, I don't use swing for anything that I do, and I don't particularly care for it, but I thought you guys were giving it a bad rap or something like that. Uh, <laughs> you know, when, when the staunchest defender of, a, of an API, you know, is, is defending it out of just this, this sort of uh, desire to defend the name, I mean, the, the problem with swing just really boils down to there's, you know, every time... Microsoft changes their UI framework every time, you know, like when XP shipped, Swing was still running with, you know, a, a Windows look and feel, right? A skin, if you will, right. that looked like Windows 2000, mm-hmm. right? And up, it's not until very recently that they even started with the JDK 1.5 uh, release, the beta release, that they're, they're starting to put in like XP look and feel, yeah. right? Right about in time for Longhorn to ship, right? Yeah. And, and just that kind of catch up. Right, they're just they're just behind, and they spend so much energy and effort trying to keep up. Well, you know what, what would really be awesome is if you could find a way to sort of use the look and feel of the operating system that you're running well, it's on. It's funny you bring that up, Carl, because <laughs> there is an API in the JavaScript, and we started with um, we started with the Abstract Windowing Toolkit, which was a UI toolkit that was literally written in a weekend for the original JDK 1.0 releases. And everybody said, this is garbage. We want something better. And that's when Sun developed Swing. 
But IBM, as part of developing Eclipse, created what they call the Standard Widget Toolkit, SWT, which is very much like, it's very much the architecture that WinForms uses. Yeah. Right? It's managed code that talks natively to the underlying OS code. And SWT apps, I mean, Eclipse rocks in many respects because it's an SWT app, because it's got, you know, it's, it's just using the underlying uh, bindings, hmm. the OS. And Sun cannot say SWT without going red in the face and getting really pissed off. What is their problem anyway? I mean, anything that's not Sun is evil. <laughs> Uh, it sounds a lot like Remnant, right? Well, it does. <laughs> now, it do- no, 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 it does. It- no, it does, Bruce. It does. And, you know, I'm not saying that they don't do that at Microsoft. But, you know, but, I mean, isn't Java supposed to be for the people, by the people, of the people, and, and you know, no you know, no Microsoft tyrannical kind of... Uh, well, that's what, it, that's what it would become. I mean, right? I'm just pointing we, out we the actually, hypocrisy, that's all. We actually start the talk by saying, you know, um, on the surface... Standard versus an implementation, and mm-hmm. it's it's, but but it's it's just on the surface. When when you get one level below the surface, you've got Microsoft desperately trying to um, open up aspects, or at least present the um, present the, the the public facade of, of an open framework. If 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 there aren't genuine efforts, Microsoft is trying to chart the course of openness. Yet we still want to make money. Right. 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 And, so yeah, and Sun's Sun's in a lot of the same boat. Right. Right. I mean, right. right. Sun, only, only Microsoft's been successful, right? Right. Well, Microsoft yeah. has more <laughs> fundamental hooks into the community, I think, than Job than oh, Sun yes. does. You oh, know yes. what I'm saying? Yes, 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 yes. And and yeah. the thing is, Sun keeps. It's funny because you listen to the two groups, right? You listen to the two companies evangelize their software, right? Microsoft goes out and says, "We are good because X, Y, and Z." Right. And Sun goes out and says, we're good because we're better than Microsoft. <laughs> it's, it's almost like Sun is building their entire marketing message around the ABM message, the anything but Microsoft camp. Right. <laughs> right. Everything has to be vendor neutral. Everything has to be portable. Everything has to be right once run anywhere. I mean, they just keep pushing right. this notion that you're not locked in. You know, vendor lock in is like the magic words. At Sun. Uh, just real quick before we start, you know what time? You know what it's time for, guys. It's time for the Linux vulnerability of the week. That's right. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> this is a uh, this is a little segment that we started on the show, and uh, you know, not that we think Microsoft Windows doesn't have bugs. We all know it does, and uh, we're not trying to point that out. We're just giving equal time to the uh, vulnerabilities that you don't hear about in Linux, and they happen frequently. So um, every week I go up to the LinuxSecurity.com advisories and I look for uh, Linux bugs. So anyway, here's one that happened uh, and it was posted on 226, which, gee, that was just um, yesterday. And uh, the topic is updated lib XML2 packages that fix an overflow when parsing remote resources are now available. So this is a fix, actually. The bug says... Uh, Yuichi Taranishi discovered a flaw in libxml2 versions prior to 2.6.6. When fetching a remote resource via FTP or HTTP, libxml uses special parsing routines. These routines can overflow a buffer if past a very long URL. Gee, that sounds very familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> if an attacker is able to find an application using libxml2 that parses remote resources and allows them to influence the URL, then this flaw could be used to execute arbitrary code. Ooh. Ooh. All users are advised to upgrade to these updated packages, which contain a, black, a, a backported fix and are not vulnerable to this issue. And there it is, our Linux vulnerability of the week. Da 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 da. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we're clapping over a vulnerability. Look at what OS it is. Give me Christmas, people. You've landed in .NET Rocks world. Yeah, we're vulnerable. Yeah, let's clap. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm missing the point here, Carl. No, no, no. There's a certain amount of tongue and cheekness about this that you're obviously missing. So. Um, they, and again, the point being that you know we don't applaud vulnerabilities, but we like to give equal time right, to those right. that we don't hear about. You yeah, know, it's, you it's, it's interesting because what you're what you're sort of tangentially touching on is the the rabid zealotry yes. that goes on. And, yes. and one of the interesting things, you know, being the editor of the serverside.net, and of course we have the serverside.com over here in the J2E space. Right. A lot of the Let's just call them the rabid zealots right, of right, Java right. hang out. 
And we did a mailing out to the the Java community, right? We, we have a newsletter that goes out bi-monthly. And we did a mailing out to the Java list saying, hey, we're announcing the server-side.net. It's a, you know, enter, uh, enterprise architecture portal and forum, blah, 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 blah. That's a pretty big deal, that website. Yeah, I, I, I think so. You, but, but you hey, guys I'm have biased. a lot of, but you have a lot of content up there. You're doing even sort of interview kind of things like we're yes. doing here, but with video, right? Yes, video tech talks. In fact, we, you did an interview with Don Box. Yep. That and was the first it. one we did. We did another one with Pat Helen. Awesome. Um, and Simon Guest uh, goes up, uh, I think it's next week. I can't remember my editorial cool. calendar offhand. Um, and, and we're plug doing for the server side. There you go. Yeah, but one of the interesting things is we did this mailing out to the Java list, right? And I was listed as the reply to address, you know, just because of if there was, you know, some kind right. of bounce or whatever, yeah, yeah. somebody has to be listed, right? And um, it was interesting because a number of people sent back responses that were less than enthusiastic <laughs> about being notified of this done. Us, we actually had people who have basically stated that they will not visit the server side.com anymore because huh. you know the middleware company the, the the people who run the server side have sold out oh jeez right they've yeah. sold out and part that's of this the, was the fallout over the the um the test score yeah I, part of that is and part of it is just living and breathing in both spaces it's amazing to me how much stronger how much more extreme the you know the java zealotry you know is as opposed to the the dot net zealotry it's just it's, that's, it's it's amazing that's something i wanted to touch on because since the beginning of the show ted you've been talking about how a lot of the differences are cultural all right and back in the day when i was when i still considered myself to be a java developer one of the things back that before you got <laughs> corrupted to the dark side right <laughs> before i got repaired one of the things that uh, <laughs> that that kind of pushed me away. It wasn't Java itself. Java doesn't bother me. You know, I think I'm fine with Java. I had a lot of good time doing doing Java server side work, um, but really, it 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 had a lot to do with the community. I found myself not so often among people who really wanted to talk about how to make things better, but about how bad Microsoft was. I used to hang out a bit. I mean, this is obviously the wrong place to go if you don't like this sort of thing. But like Java lobby. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. and the high quantity, I mean, Carlos Perez is probably the one guy who drove me away from Java. Don't because every bring time, up his name. I'm sorry about that. But every time <laughs> I wanted to talk about .NET, it was, it, it was never .NET is bad for this technical reason. It was .NET is bad because Bill Gates is a SEAL clubbing bastard or something like that. <laughs> it, was never, it was never technical. And I found a lot of that in the Java community, and that pushed me away. The culture pushed me away more than anything else. And and you've been talking about that. I think that's a really important point because there's so much more going on than just the technical differences. Yeah, I hate WebSphere. You know, sure, whatever. <laughs> mm-hmm. I have some technical gripes, but the thing that actually drove me away was definitely the culture. Do you think that comes from the open source community that migrated into the Java world, or no, or is that I, just I, Java I, zealotry in general? I think it's what I think it really what it really boils down to. And, and Bruce has this this great phrase that he uses uh, when we do this this talk. And so, Bruce, I'm going to co-opt your phrase for a second. He said the 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 market followers right are always looking for ways you know to to get into the market leader. For example, the market followers are always looking for ways to create standards, right? And the market leader is looking for ways to make everything proprietary. Hmm. And I think in some respects what happened was uh, for a while there, Java was the market follower. And the, you know, when, when Java sort of flipped, right, when Java became the market leader, uh, it was really sort of the, the first success people have had against the Microsoft camp for quite a while, hmm. right? And, and Linux may do the same thing. We, the jury's still out on that one in yeah. a big way. Right. Um, but it really created the situation where Sun and the other, you know, Java folks who'd sort of championed it and evangelized it had, you know, yeah, we won, we won, we won. And right. there was a period of time, you know, from 97 to 2000, I'd say, where it really was clear that J2EE was the dominant way of developing J2EE right. and, and Java. Yeah. And now, you know, with the announcement and the release and subsequent, you know, version 1.1 release of .NET, Microsoft is starting to, you know, make that climb back. It's yeah. starting to turn it into a race again. Mm-hmm. And I think these guys, very frankly, are, they're, they're so desperate for a win, right? right. They're so desperate. Everybody for- wants their team to win. 
Well, that's part that's of it. Basically, but it. it's also it's 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 almost like you know because of the vendor fragmentation, mm. right? I mean, IBM is definitely a big firm, but they have a lot of fingers and a lot of pies. Right. So As do Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah, but Microsoft has sort of this unidirectional vision. Uh, one true. of the interesting things that happened at Java One, uh, I think it was two thousand two or two thousand three. I can't remember. Was we had the CEOs of these various Java leading firms, Oracle, IBM, BEA. They stood up, and instead of in previous years, they took pot shots at Microsoft. Mm. They took pot shots at each other. Really? Wow. And that was, 2002. was it two thousand two? Thanks. Yeah. Um, it's kind of like you know Dean and Edwards, basically. Yeah. You know, with Terry standing on the sidelines, just waiting for them to destroy themselves. Well, yeah, but it also you know you know it, it's a really good analogy you just brought up here because in the last debate, right. The candidates were very, very gentle with one another. Right. right. They didn't really take pot shots at each other because there's a recognition that, okay, we're still going to have to go fight right. Bush. Yeah. Right. And we're still going to have to go have some kind of unified front when this is all said and done. And the JAMA vendors have this really weird relationship with one another based around that same principle. Hmm. And the open source guys are the ones who can be, you know, they, they can be as radical as an extremist as they want. Yeah. Because they don't have any real corporate. Um, corporate responsibilities. They don't have to pay out to shareholders. They don't right. have to make money at the end of the day. Part, part of the issue is that so many people have so much invested, right? Since, since mm-hmm. there is a little bit of a, a cultural bias and, and since um, not many people do cross over from, from one side to the other very frequently, we've got our skills to consider. Mm-hmm. And, and um, with the recent soft economy, people are scared. Very right? much so. So, so it's not... It's not people are pulling for one platform or another when they're, they're pulling for their jobs. And, right, and right. If we on, switch on. to .NET, will I have a job tomorrow? Right. I mean, yeah, that's something that worries me, actually. I was going to say, you know, Carl was talking about how everybody wants their team to win, and I was thinking kind of at what cost. You know, you have this guy out in the audience who's defending Swing, even though he doesn't use it. He might not know anything about it even, and he's going to defend it just because it's his team. Mm-hmm. That's the point at which I think it gets really, really scary, and, and you're getting away from what's important, which is the technical yeah, issues. Well, and, and, I th- and, and also, I was, I was, I was also going to say, one of the greatest things I ever read, it was a story either by Richard Dawkins or Carl Sagan. I get the two mixed up because they were both such great pop sci writers. And, and it was a story of a lecture that was being given, at a university, and the man giving the lecture was was the young up and coming, uh, breaking new ground lecturer. And in the audience was the guy whose theories he was destroying. Okay, and as he went through piece by piece, ruined this guy's entire <laughs> academic life. <laughs> We're talking <laughs> decades of work. Um, at the very end, you know, the first guy to clap was the guy whose work was completely annihilated. And he went up to the front of the stage and he said, you know, all these years I've been wrong. Thank you for opening my eyes. Mm, and yeah. that's the kind of integrity that I'd like to see. And it worries me when people defend ideas, whether they think they're right or wrong. Well, the yeah, scientific what... community is very, very much like that, Rory. Yeah. yeah. And this is definitely not the scientific community. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting because, you know, amongst, amongst the scientific community, there is that notion of if you, can, if you can show me, you know, objective results that back your theories, right. definitely I'm willing, to con, you know, I'm willing to say yes, I can see based on the experiments yep. that I can recreate. You can't deny logic. That, yeah, you can't deny fact. And reason. Right? And that's one of the things that we run into here is it's so hard to be able to establish what is fact what is and fact. what is opinion and what is what is And what is marketing, so, yeah. It, it is very yeah. subjective, and that's yeah. another thing. I'm surprised we haven't brought up Java 1.5 because I was going to say, for example, at a very superficial level, in terms of con- convincing me to work with Java, if you're trying to convince me of anything, like, for example, I don't like the syntax for metadata in Java 1.5 and including metadata in your classes. Um, Rory, you realize I sit on that board, right? That's fine. <laughs> that is fine. I don't, Get him, Roy. Yeah. So, so, wait a minute, Ted. So, your response to me, thank you for telling me that I've been wrong all these years <laughs> and opening my eyes. I appreciate that. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I can do that. I just uh, too see, much ego see, Roy, invested. See, this is not the scientific community. Yeah. As I, no, the, anyway. the, the reality is that, well, that's the point. Though. It's not the scientific community, and and we were just talking about objectivism. And I had to admit to myself that the reality is that there are going to be superficial things that might keep me away, even in spite of the strong mm-hmm. technical underpinnings. Yeah. You're not the only one, by the way. Uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, a, a large open source developer, Dennis Sosnowski, is with you. He really doesn't like the syntax, 
But it was interesting. I'm really glad I did this this uh, community standards experience, right? Being a part of GSR 175, which is the the specification that's defining, you know, the metadata, the annotations, and so forth. Because you know, we wrestled with syntax for a while, and everybody, of course, has their own opinions about what will work and what won't work. But at the end of the day, we've got to ship something. Do you right. think Java? Do you think Java needs to have a sort of uh, a language? level like like uh, .NET does in order to separate the platform from the language? Happen. It's not going to happen, happen, Bruce? It will not happen. And, and the reason, um, if you think about it, um, you know, what's what's the center of the universe for Sun? Java. It, it's the Java language, yeah. right? Does that make sense? No, yeah, it's true. It, it, it's, it's, not their, it's not their hardware. In fact, their hardware couldn't compete if, if they didn't have the mind share behind the Java platform, right? right? And that's that's a big reason that you're... you're um, that Java hasn't been released to the open source community. And I'm not throwing rocks at, at Sun on this point. I mean, I think that the center of Microsoft's universe is the Windows operating system, right? Mm-hmm. So in large measure, their policies of supporting multiple languages are to pull those legacy languages from previous operating systems up to the current .NET platform, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I'm saying that the motivation of Sun is driven by its business needs, and, and um, the same is true of, of the Microsoft side as well. And in fact, I've been um, a member of a research and development team at IBM. Um, I was there for five years, and, and we were absolutely destroyed by trying to solve this, this problem of language neutrality, and, and it's, it's a daunting one, you know? And what do you think of .NET's uh, approach to that, Bruce? Um, I, I think it's I think it's a, a noble goal, and I think it's a, a difficult problem to solve transparently. And, and you're seeing part of it in your, your debate between just the, the syntactic, right? Um, the, the syntactic goals of C sharp versus Visual Basic, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And and I mean, here we're talking about two procedural languages, right? We haven't really tried to push that very hard towards. Um, other languages, like declarative languages, like um, SQL or rules-based yeah. languages. Do you think that's ultimately going to hurt Java? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it already is. I think that right now, one of the things that you're seeing in the Java community is it's starting to collapse under its own weight as far as complexity is concerned. Right? There's, there's. It's interesting because there's been a sort of a, a movement within the Java space that, that you know, obviously, you know, being in the .NET world, Carl, you wouldn't see, but there's some languages that are coming out, including one called Groovy, which is gathering some, you know, open source steam, huh. which is sort of an interesting, it, he sort of collects up some interesting aspects of like Ruby and so forth uh, into this language that compiles into JVM bytecode and executes on the Java mm-hmm. platform and so forth, um, including, you know, when when uh, when the Zen paper, right, the X Sharp paper was released at Upsilon and so forth, I said, yes, I want something like this in, you know, instead of trying to bring you know, the, the object and the relational world together by creating an API and an object relational layer. Why don't we bring the notion of tuples as a first-class concept into the language? And James Strakan, the guy who writes Groovy, you know, responded a, with a post on his blog that said, oh, look, Groovy can do that, right? Here, here's a way we could make this work within this language. And I thought, hmm. you know, voila. I think, right. I, I think we've just proven to some degree why different languages, right? Not... The, the whole multi-language thing isn't really, for me, C-sharp versus VB. Yeah, right? yeah. Those are two sides of the same coin. Right, what right. I want to see are two smooth, wildly really. different languages. Right. I want to well, be we can also look at, there, there are some success stories out there. I mean, Jython has been around for a while. Yes. And Jython is a fabulous piece of work. And, and there are places where it's actually really useful. I mean, where you would definitely want to use Jython. I was thinking I was doing some AS400 work. And I was doing some Java on the, on the AS400. And I was thinking that it might be a whole lot of fun to hook Jython into that system so that I could have a nice lightweight scripting. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, and, to... and there are other... There are other yeah, there's, um, there's good open source apps out there that use, uh, .net, that use ASP.NET, even C-sharp and VB. Yeah, and, and the, the whole multi-language thing in general is, is good. It, it, it's funny. I don't know if you guys recognize this. Have you, have you heard of the uh, aspect oriented language Aspect J? No, I haven't. Yes. Okay. Rory has. Yeah. Um, this is probably one of the first, you know, from the ground up aspect oriented languages as opposed to, you know, something that sort of bolts on cool. afterwards. And the author of, well, one of the guys who principally worked on Aspect J is Jim Huguenin, the same guy who did Jython. Huh. Interesting. 
And yet, do these things have to succeed despite of Sun, right? Where, where uh, right. Microsoft has, exactly. has right. whole departments, you know, 20, 30, 50 guys that are, that are supporting the multi-language effort. Well, an old friend has stopped by and uh, wants to uh, say hello, Dan Appleman. Hey, Dan, are you there? Hi, Carl. I was listening uh, earlier to what you were saying, and the kind of language I would really like to see is a language that does for .NET what Visual Basic did for original Windows programming, made it so easy that anybody could do it. You don't think Visual Basic .NET does that? Not yet, it doesn't. Yeah, I don't. I agree with you, but I've just you know I, I know I know your name uh, you know principally from you know the Visual Basic space, and I'm you know I agree with you, but I was just a little surprised to hear you say it. I think what Dan is saying is that, you know, for, for guys like you and me and, and programmers who, uh, who are not, who are programmers, VisualBasic.net is a good solution. For the person who isn't a programmer, which is what VB10 was intended for. Mm-hmm. And Dan, uh, well, actually, you've, been, you've been talking about the idea of creating an abstraction layer over the .NET framework in order to accomplish this. Is that right? Right. So someday, someday that would be really nice. I don't know whether the next uh, edition of, uh, of Visual Basic is going to do it or not. You know, one of the things that's really interesting is that, uh, you know, we just released a lot of our source code that we hadn't done in the past. And uh, some people are sort of surprised that we at Desaware have been programming in Visual Basic.net. So all your .NET, all your .NET products are just some? No, all of our .NET products are written in Visual Basic.net. Wow. Mm-hmm. And, and we did that because, you know, we come from a background of both C++ and, uh, and Visual Basic. And when it looked like which, which .NET language should we program in, we had really a choice. Do we keep going in C++? Do we switch to C Sharp, which is really a new language? Or do we go to VB.NET, which is a pretty easy migration, relatively speaking, from the VB6 side? Wow, that's cool. What now? You you also have done some open source uh, things. I'm in particular thinking about your obfuscation utility. Is that true? Yeah. Well, the obfuscation utility is a great example of why you should choose the right language for the task. Uh, that that program is a real interesting combination of C plus plus and Visual Basic .NET, where we use C plus plus for the lowest level, where we do. Uh, you know, sort of the, the PE mangling and the COM and the, the mixed managed and unmanaged code. But we put all the high-level logic in Visual Basic.net because you get the efficiency. And, you know, it's a higher level of programming. It's a much easier development environment. So this was unmanaged C++ you're talking about? Oh, yeah. I love okay. unmanaged C++. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I, just, I just, when you said C++, right, now there's two flavors of it. I just wasn't, wasn't sure which flavor we were talking about. Yeah. Well, in .NET, the only reason to use C++ is when you need to mix the two. Hmm. Good because point. there is no, there is no better way to mix managed than unmanaged code. They they did it absolutely brilliantly. Right. It's it's impossible to read the code, but it is brilliant. <laughs> well, and and you know Stan Lipman, uh, who's now I guess architect or principal language designer or something of of you know C plus plus right, having gone to Microsoft uh, at uh, Dev Connections in October of two thousand one, he pretty much said the same thing. Right, this is the guy who's like one of the founding fathers of C++. He said he could not figure out for the life of him how to do a managed array of arrays. The syntax was just so hideous. And so now they're going back and changing all the syntax to yeah. try and make it a little bit more approachable. So i got to say that uh, if the syntax is unapproachable and hideous, then it sounds like good old standard C++ to me. <laughs> Be nice, Roy. Be nice. It doesn't sound like didn't think fancy. I mean, <laughs> it, but yeah, it's actually... So exactly. It's harder than good old fashioned C plus plus. Okay. <laughs> That's great. For me, I already have a difficult time with the regular stuff, but yeah, I'm a little it's, bit scared of C plus plus. It's, it's taking it's taking old fashioned C plus plus and adding a whole bunch of new custom attributes and and weird syntax on top of it. Right. Well, I mean, C++, look at plus 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 plus. Well, look at the task <laughs> they faced. Right. You're, you're trying to create a language that not only bridges three paradigms. Right. Object, uh, meta object, and procedural. Right. It right. bridges all three of those. But now we're adding the fact that it has to bridge both unmanaged and managed code. I mean, that's a tall a, order. Right. It's almost a C++, Sharp++, if you will. 
Dot net. <laughs> exactly. You got it. All we need yeah. now is for Manage C++ to compile down the JVM bytecode, and I think we found the one language fits all. <laughs> you know, to kind of tie it all together, though, Dan, you were talking about how we need to have a language that did for developers what VB1 did, and people have been saying the exact same thing for the Java camp, and that also ties back into the idea of multi-language support in Java. People yeah. are saying that for Java to really pick up, at least in terms of the desktop development, and this is just what I've heard, Sun needs a VB-like language. They need something in addition going on there. Yeah, and see, but it, that will never happen because, as Bruce said, the center of the universe for Sun is Java. I mean, if you right. take Java away from Sun, Sun has nothing left. Maybe yeah. they need to uh, rethink that strategy. Agreed. Well, yeah, because they have T or something like that. Or No, know. T is an open source project. Well, Bruce, you, you agree with that? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, actually... Um, the sun is actually thinking in this direction, but the, the, their, their solution is going to make you laugh. Actually, IBM was not at Java 1 because all of sun's focus was on getting Java into the hands of those visual basic programmers, right? Right. And um, it, it, it's, not, it's not that funny until, until you think of the number of um, IDE development vendors that sun has squashed by acquiring right. them, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. Forte, iPlanet, on and on and on. Yeah, and and so um, they're saying, okay, now we're gonna we're gonna go go to these Visual Basic programmers with open arms, and we're gonna actually build something that's easy to use and and useful. Yeah, well, it's interesting because a uh, uh, a friend of mine, uh, who's another who's an MVP, a C Sharp MVP, Kathy Giro, she was she was basically she was working for some uh, a client of hers who wanted her to do some Java development. So you know, she asked, well, can I you know can I basically call you up with questions and so forth? So I said, yeah, no problem. Not you know. Absolutely. She's a friend. Literally every day for a couple of weeks, she's calling me and, and asking, well, why can't I just, you know, do, you know, why, what's this, what do I do to build, right? Why, you know, it's just F5 in the IDE right. in Visual Studio and, and in, you know, in, in Java, it's like I got to go through and I got to create an ant file and I got to do this and I got to do that. Yeah. You know, and I found out later she's using NetBeans, which is the IDE that, that Sun is currently pushing. Right, it's an IDE written in Swing, and it you know ships with like ten thousand different plugins, nine thousand of which you would never use. Hmm. And so you know it starts up, and you go to lunch, and when you come back <laughs> yeah. from lunch, it might be ready for you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just and and I look at this, and I say, and the guys who push this down the throats of Java developers are going to turn around and create an IDE that's going to be attractive to Visual Basic developers. Yeah, I. I'll believe it when that's, I see it, but... That's where I came from, actually. I went from VB to Java, and the first ID that I was using was Forte. And uh, it was a whole new world. The, yeah. the, the tools were just not there. And yeah. uh, Carlos Perez said they were, but I, well, I got to say, I believe... <laughs> but poor see, Carlos, he's part of this picked on today. <laughs> well, but I, I, have, I have issues with Carlos. Anyway, he did 101 reasons to prefer Java over .NET. 85 of which were basically Microsoft sucks. sucks. Yeah. Or, you know, <laughs> it was either Microsoft sucks or we have open source developers that do that. Right. So right. Said we have it's the position or, that he's arguing for yeah. is what's going on. But yeah, so the tools I felt weren't really there. E Eclipse was a bit nicer. Eclipse was a nice experience. Although, of course, then I was lacking my GUI tools, which is something that I wanted as a VB developer. Right. I don't know where Eclipse right. is now, but when I was using it, it was just code, 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 code. So. If you think GUI tools, uh, Java is never really going to catch up. But it, I mean, if, if you're talking about just an ID and, and a cool way, way to write server-side code, I don't think anything beats idea. Agreed. Agreed. I mean, visual, Dan, uh, did you want to say something? Query. Well, actually, I, I really am looking for just entire new paradigms of, well, let's put it this way. It seems to me that both sides, Microsoft and the Java camp, seem to be in pursuit of functionality and complexity rather than simplicity and elegance. Great. Right. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of guys that Bruce and I speak with on the No Fluff Just Stuff tour who are exactly in that same space that, that you're just mentioning, Dan. And, you know, one of the things they're liking, for example, is Ruby. Uh, it's a, you know, it's another language. It's got some interesting features to it. It's an object-oriented scripting type language. And, hmm. you know, they're thinking, yeah, here's, here's simplicity, here's elegance. Right. But again, it's a language for programmers. It doesn't fit your criteria of, I want something that non-programmers can approach. Right. Yeah. Well, guys, uh, we are almost out of time. So before we say goodbye, I want to, uh, first of all, say thanks to Dan, uh, for stopping by. Thank you, Dan. Is there any, anything you want to mention, uh, before you? Go off. Any any announcements? I'd like to invite everyone to visit. We just launched a completely new website, 
and uh, we're really excited about it. So desaware.com. Great. What did you, what was it written in? Uh, HTML. It was, <laughs> oh, <you're funny. laughs> it's written in HTML, this brand new technology. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it is, it is uh, HTML and it's uh, ASP.net. Great. Sweet. All right. Thanks a lot. And uh, Bruce, is there anything that you want to mention before we let you go? Yeah, I definitely agree with Dan's point that we need simpler Java. And on on that topic, I'm writing a book called Better, Faster, Lighter Java about Hmm. stripping away some of the J2E complexity. Cool. Okay. And Ted, is there any uh, last-minute call to action for the listeners or announcements? Um, Well, you know, this is, uh, I guess, since this is the the window for plugs, uh, I will plug the fact that I've got a a book coming out, uh, hopefully in the the Java 1 time frame this year, called Effective Enterprise Java. Okay. Um, and uh, really, it's it's you know it's not even so much a it's kind of like effective Java was right. I mean, a number of people, including Chris Sell, said I have just found the best book for .NET development, and it's called Effective Java. But hmm. you just have to sort of mentally <laughs> translate the Java code fragments into right. uh, into C sharp. Uh, a lot of the things that I talk about in that book are really you know technology agnostic. Um, cool. They're really more along the lines of just how to think about enterprise apps. So. That's good, and we really appreciate your insights. Uh, it's been I personally have really enjoyed listening to you speak for yeah, these this last was a couple good hours. Show. I had a good time. And uh, the lucky winner of the uh, Windows Server 2003 happens to be Ba-da-da-dum. Brian Kuhn from Kenwick School District in Kenwick, uh, Washington. <sighs> Brian, congratulations! <laughs> you are the proud owner of a bouncing baby box. <laughs> Use it in good health up there in your school district. I know you will. Uh, well, on behalf of myself and Rory, guys, I'd like to uh, thank you very much for coming on the show, and uh, we will see you next time on .NET Rocks. Thanks a lot, guys. Time.